sorry, office hours. So a big, a big kind of uh, milestone that we have reached is we have been actively in the second collection window, the winter monitoring. Um, we have returned sort of first uh, comments do, does not meet meets meets with recommendation for these winter monitoring items. Uh, regional program managers change the status. We say that we have reviewed them. Um, and then you have to actually, if you're a district that's been monitored, you would find yourself clicking LEA results review started at the top of the sections page. So I know folks are getting used to that now with application revisions and with monitoring often with our Grants For Me platform, if something seems uneditable or you're not seeing the information, it's probably a status change that is required. So for monitoring items, if you wanna see what results your district received for the items you submitted, be sure to click on LEA results review started. And you have until March 1st, which is a Friday, to submit the resubmissions. Um, and just wanted to show you that you'd go here, then this arrow shows where those responses sit on the sections page. So they're not in the individual. When you guys upload, I believe you go to your individual item pages, but now everything sits in kind of a, a sort of a response, um, a response page. So this is where you would see, if it does not meet, it'll be in red and it'll have a place for you. It'll say what needs to be uploaded. Um, so for many, I'm gonna go over what a big kind of finding was for us in Title I in a moment. So just wanted to make sure everyone's comfortable knowing where to access uh, the comments and the review um, in the monitoring instrument off of the sections page. And that little pencil will be where you can uh, upload your documentation. So again, the deadline being March 1st. You can always reach out to your regional program manager if you have questions. There are fact sheets online on our monitoring page in case you want more information about a particular item, including statutory references and the like. The one really big one that I do want to call out is some of you who must have felt this that for those that were monitored, really the big one for winter was this parent's right to know for Title I. And from my experience as a Title I coordinator, a lot of what we monitor for is the family engagement piece of Title I, hugely important in Title I to be consistent with communication and collaboration with families and just be transparent with the information that they're allowed to have about their programming. So the parent's right to know is specific in statute to teacher qualifications, as well as policies and procedures with local and state assessments. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of clarify that this can be one letter sent out uh, as of right to know, or it can be multiple letters, one about teacher qualifications that parents have a right to request at any time, uh, information about the teacher, like their classroom teacher, their student's classroom teacher. And then the other one being that at any time they have a right to ask whether it's the principal or district, whoever you point them towards, to ask about what policies and procedures they can expect with assessments in the district. Um, some of you did show some like testing calendars, which was awesome to see, but didn't have that statutory language that is a requirement. So you'll see why that might be a does not meet. But I was overall very happy to see the efforts that are put in to communicate with parents, transparent information about their Title I programs, um, and happy to see school-wide programs that have a lot of integrated parent you know, handbooks um, and ability for them to provide feedback and the like. But you can always reach out to your regional program manager. They have these samples that can be shared. This is all in our newsletter as well. And a while back, I made a family engagement reference document, which is exactly what it sounds like. It goes through all of statute that's related to Title I family engagement. And it, it, it sort of pulls out what the requirements are. And that does have a parent's right to know section right on that reference guide. So if folks can share that in the chat, that would be great if you haven't already. Um, but that is that has been, uh, that has been a, a, a hugely uh, big one this time around. So I just wanna make sure all the districts get this right. 
Um, and once you have that language, just get into the habit of sending it or having it embedded in your communications to parents and you'll be good to go with this requirement for all future, for all future cycles. Uh, Jess? Okay, just putting that resource in the chat. Um, all right, so Title I Summer, Title I-A Summer Reallocated application is going to be coming out soon. Um, there are, as, as always, limited funds. So this year there's also an ARP um, ESSER application that has significantly more funding um, and allows for more flexibility for you to do program outside of Title I schools. So we just wanna note that they also have a deadline of March 29. So if you're looking to do more robust programming or just wanna to apply to a pot that is a little bigger, I, we would recommend that. Um, in terms of Title I-A reallocated, um, the application will be coming out soon. We're just finalizing it. And once that's ready, we'll send out a notification to all ESEA coordinators through Grants for Me. We'll also be having a training on March 5th just to walk through what the application looks like. It's going to be very similar to last year. Um, it will be recorded and we'll send that as, out as well after that's done. And the deadline will be March 29th. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to um, your regional program manager. And I see um, Dawn's question, where is ARP application housed? That is also in Grants for Me. And um, there was a notification that went out through the, the newsroom. So I believe your regional program manager can forward that to you as well. And if they don't have access, we can we can send that along. Yeah, it's a, I, and to clarify too, it's a separate application this year. We had kind of a weird system. I think ARP funding kind of came late in the game last year. And so they kind of attached to our skeleton and we did this kind of like amalgamation monster of an application. There are two separate ones now, and it does feel a little funny, but honest to recommend going with ARP funding. Uh, if you are worried that there could be limited budgeted funds and you would like to request, I mean, these funds are gonna expire. Title ones, we tend to journal and be able to kind of keep our Title I funding and keep up summer reallocated applications maybe in future years. We are gonna have it. We do not know how much money we have. So we just wanna, it's, it's, it's an odd thing, but this year that might be a good route for folks to go. Just wanted to be really clear about that because I remember calling a bunch of districts last year and saying, are you sure you can't under budget a little bit? Or are you sure you're not over budgeting? Because I was trying to fit everybody in to get what they needed for their summer programs. And so i um, hoping not to even have to have those conversations this year. Great. Um, the next topic we want to talk about is just allowability under Title I-A, in particular around family engagement nights. We've had a lot of back and forth in invoicing, so just hoping to clarify some of this information up front. Um, we see a lot of math and literacy events for family engagement, which is great, um, but we just want you to be mindful that decor is typically unallowable. What you need to pay for is for supplies that are directly connected to academic improvement, which is the the title, the name of Title I. Um, so small incentives like a certificate for doing well or something like that, or, or books, we see that a lot, like, like book prizes, those could be allowable, um, but typically you don't wanna charge decor expenses. Food is another very hot button issue. With federal funds in general, we do not recommend using food. The burden of proof is very, very high. So if we see any invoice with food, we're gonna be asking a lot of questions. Um, food under family engagement could potentially be allowable if you have evidence and proof that it increases attendance and engagement to meet high needs in your ESEA application. But again, just a lot of proof is required and 
for any of these items, they have to pass the typical, reasonable, allowable, necessary test. So it, it can't be, at, you know, outrageous costs. And in general, we definitely recommend staying away from food when possible because it's it's complicated. Um, if you do feel like that is necessary, you have evidence for why it is, then in order to avoid delays in invoicing, you'll want to be as specific as possible in your application and write out exactly what you're getting. And then we can already check those boxes of reasonable, necessary, allowable, and that'll prevent an invoice from being rejected. Um, so when in doubt, you always want to reach out to your regional program manager and just check ahead of time, put in an application, make sure it's approved, then you're good to go. Um, but yeah, those are two tricky areas with allowability for Title I. And before I before I read what's on this slide, I, I want to just highlight something Jess just said. That's really good advice across titles and across projects. And that the more details that are in the application that exist, the more likely things are to be approved when they come through for reimbursement. The more, say, vague and generic the application is, the more kind of gray area that exists then the more likely there are to be surprises when something gets submitted for reimbursement that may not be allowable. So just always one of those best practices, especially with anything that might be on the line, feel free to reach out ahead of time before those funds are committed so you can make sure that you can get reimbursed for them. All right, and for this next item, we are excited to announce that we're going to be holding an equitable services for non-public schools training on February 28th. So it's been a few years since we've done something specifically for our non-public partners and their public school counterparts. Uh, we're hoping that this training will help us kind of get everyone on the right foot, get everyone on the same page and provide you know, some background information for those folks who might be new to ESEA funds or new in their roles at the non-public schools or even as an ESEA coordinator. And then for our more seasoned and experienced folks, provide some best practices and maybe some new resources you can use to help make this process as smooth as possible. Uh, one special note is we are gonna add an assurance to the non-public consultation for the FY25 application that they have to have attended or watched the recorded training in order to receive equitable services. While this isn't a foolproof way to make sure that all of our issues get ironed out in the future, at the very least there's, you know, some guarantee that you know we at the main department of education have provided the the training and that they have received it so that hopefully if there are some disagreements in the future we can point to that and say this was something we covered in the training as an allowable use or an unallowable use um, i know we've had uh, some issues with monitoring come up lately we want to cover monitoring allowable fiscal uses what each title can be used for what are best practices in the consultation process really try to make sure we're getting everyone set up for some success. So we'll be putting out some communication through the newsroom on this in the, in the coming days, but we'll provide the Zoom link to all of you. It is also in the newsletter. Please pass it on to your non-public partners so that they have it. They can get it on their calendars now, or at the very least, they can be on the lookout for that recorded training a little while after the 28th. Good morning, everyone. Just wanted to give you an update on Maine's model of school support. Um, I'm Monique Sullivan, and I am the uh, School Improvement Coordinator for the department. And if you attended the Tier 3 Principals meeting uh, back in January, this is the same information that we, we gave. There is no change at this point, but information related to Maine's model of school support remains unavailable until the Maine Department of Education receives final U.S. Department of Education's amendment approval, and once finalized and provided, Maine DOE staff will reach out to schools identified for additional supports. Uh, our tentative date is, um, you know, the end of February, early March. It's probably going to be more March than um, February, but the this was provided in a priority notice that put what went to superintendents back out uh, back at the end of January. So. Um, it's probably going to be more like March, but hope maybe it'll be by the end of this month, but we're not sure. The other thing is, um, <clears throat> in that priority notice, it also mentioned that the ESA dashboard is going live or went live yesterday. So um, um, hopefully 
your superintendent um, was able to look at that information and make sure it was all up to date, but it did go live yesterday. So that's just an update for you. With 22, with the, with 22, 23 data. We don't have Tyra Corson. So I think uh, Travis is going to uh, give, <laughs> give his best effort here to be Tyra. Yes, I, I will do my best tire impression this morning. <laughs> Please. Uh, good, good morning, everyone. Um, just going to go over a couple of quick fiscal related items here this morning. Uh, first thing I want to draw your attention to here is that um, now that we're in 2024, we do have a number of different um, currently open grants that are going to uh, officially expire later this year. Um, so this time of year tends to be a really good time to, if you haven't recently, um, to check in with your uh, business office counterpart and just get a sense of where you are with relation to your uh, ESCA funding uh, for fiscal years 22 and 23. Um, both of those awards for ESCA Consolidated um, as well as Tier 3 School Improvement are going to expire in September of this year. Um, and so now is a good time to start thinking about um, you know, some potential alternative uses for funds if uh, you're in a situation where you have a large balance and you uh, may not otherwise spend that between now and September. Um, you know, things perhaps PD this spring or uh, programming over the summer are certainly things uh, worth looking to here uh, if you find yourself uh, having a, a notable balance that needs to be drawn down by September. Okay, uh, just a general reminder here that uh, the department is now offering a uh, fiscally oriented office hour for district business managers. Uh, this is something that occurs monthly uh, and includes representatives from um, all of the different uh, teams within the department that deal with federal funds. Um, so ESEA, IDEA, um, CTE, et cetera. Um, so a real good place if you or your business manager have questions, concerns, or just kind of keep up with, with what's happening across the different uh, federal teams here at DOE. Uh, those meetings occur uh, the last Thursday of every month at 10 a.m. Um, and I'm going to put a link in chat here real quick uh, where you guys can go to access the department's professional development calendar. Um, if you're interested in the next uh, session that's coming up on the 29th, uh, just go ahead and navigate to that day in the calendar, uh, and you should have an option to register for uh, that office hour. Okay, something else we wanted to touch on briefly today. Um, there are, I think, a handful of folks who likely have had some um, notification, interaction, what have you, with the department with regard to temporary holds on ESEA funds. Um, and essentially where, where we are as a state agency right now, um, you know, over the last couple of years, particularly uh, during and uh, shortly after the pandemic, we were more or less giving school districts wide latitude with regard to um, submission deadlines, timelines, what have you, you know, just kind of understanding the nature of, of where everyone was at and um, providing as much uh, flexibility as we could. Now that we're kind of moving to the other side or the, the pendulum starting to move in the other direction. Um, we are kind of moving more toward having hard and fast deadlines for our submissions. Um, and so what we've instituted here over recently and, and will likely do here over the, the kind of immediate future is this process of temporary holds on funds for school districts that have long overdue items um, for ESEA. That could be an application, uh, a performance report, or things having to do with monitoring. Uh, again, the, the intent here is to really um, emphasize the importance of this work and getting things done timely. Um, we've had some issues here on, on our end where you know, a lot of the data that we're required to report federally as a state, uh, we collect directly from you folks through applications, performance reports and whatnot. And so when those don't come in on time or if those are, you know, months past the deadline, um, it started to impact us a little bit with our ability to complete our own federal reporting as a state agency. 
Um, so that's that's kind of the background of of why we're we're starting to institute this um, process of of temporary holds on funds until work is completed. Um, now, I want to emphasize that these are temporary holds of funds. It's not a situation of us pulling awards or um, or anything like that. It's just a temporary pause on access to funds until such time as uh, whatever the required work is that we're looking for has been completed. Um, so as of right now, these holds are only specific to ESEA consolidated funds. So Title One, Two, II, Three, et cetera. Um, and then uh, as some of you may have already seen as well, as soon as the requisite work is completed, that hold is almost immediately lifted from your funds, meaning you can resume uh, invoicing for funds um, and recouping expenses um, as necessary. So again, just something um, folks may not have been that familiar with, um, but essentially, if you're in a situation where this is the case, you will get communication not only through the Grants for Me system, um, but you'll also get communication from your, your regional program manager. Um, similarly, if you have questions, um, related to this, feel free to reach out to your regional program manager for uh, clarification and support. And if Dan has not joined us, I'll just kind of keep going here. Um, so when it comes to split payments for invoices, um, for example, if you have Let's say you have a $5,000 expense for the month of October. You've got $1,000 left in your uh, preceding fiscal year award, and you want to charge the remainder to your new year. Um, that would be an example of uh, splitting an invoice between two uh, different fiscal years for the same uh, ESEA program. Uh, in order to be able to do that, you need to make sure that um, splitting the uh, payment and the period of performance ac across both requests is uh, allowable, uh, meaning you wouldn't want to try and split a payment um, for something uh, in one year, and then maybe you didn't have substantial approval until later for the following year. That might be an example of something that you wouldn't be able to directly split. Um, but by and large, uh, if you're using funding from, from two different fiscal years, make sure that the period of availability overlaps uh, make sure that um, you've appropriately allocated that expense locally in your uh, accounting records to both grants. Um, and of course, upload the uh, requisite supporting documentation to evidence that, you know, X percentage of this cost is charged to this fiscal year and X percentage of this cost is charged to the following fiscal year. Okay, and just a couple of quick um, recommendations here uh, as far as uh, timely payments are concerned. Uh, we know that our state accounting office has, uh, for the lack of a better phrase, been backed up uh, as of late and that um, payment requests for ESEA are taking a little bit longer than normal. Um, we are currently working within the state of Maine to try and um, make some enhancements or, or make some forward progress in that regard so that things aren't taking, you know, three weeks uh, to approve. Um, but essentially the, the best um, or most help that we can get from folks in the field at this point in terms of making sure that things are processed in a timely and efficient way is to make sure that payment requests come in in a way that we can easily approve, uh, i.e. we don't have to um, return something because it's missing documentation or because the um, you know, the, the service period on the invoice doesn't match the service period on the backup documentation. Um, I know the submission of these can be, you know, fast and furious and, you know, maybe it's something that, you know, you've got five minutes to do between meetings or, or something like that. Um, we ask that folks just try and make sure that what you submit is true and accurate, um, and that you ensure that what you're submitting for reimbursement, um, you know, so some earlier points that are made are not only allowable, but align with what's in your approved application. Um, you know, covering those bases for all intents and purposes should uh, ensure that your invoice moves forward in a timely fashion.
Well, thanks, Travis. And as always, we have our professional learning opportunities with our fancy new template from the DOE. Hope you guys realize we've gotten a facelift a little bit since last month with our slides. Look at that. And then uh, contact information. Also, snazzy little slide now, just to remember who you're talking to. I, I've seen a lot of questions about summer, and truthfully, we haven't connected with ARP, and we can meaningfully to, to talk about the differences. But I just want to again emphasize with Title I reallocated. I'll, I'll put up the slide again. Remember that these summer programmings are technically really for your targeted needs. Yes. So if if Title I, if you work with your Title I students, you have a Title I summer program, you want to do the same things you've done, for sure. You can wait till this application's out and you can apply for summer funds. The reason why Jess and I are just wanting to give you a caveat is we don't have $3 million. <laughs> we're not going to have $3 million. Um, and we're maybe not even going to have a million. So 63 districts applied for one and a half million dollars last summer. So I just want to be really upfront because if if we run out of funds, not every program gets funded. And I, so we always just want to give caveats because we don't know. Maybe we can fund all the programs. Maybe I'm calling to say, can you lower your budget like I did last year? So um, ARP is summer innovation. I don't, you you know, Title I kids can be part of that. Uh, it could be your robust summer programming if you want more field trips. Remember that last year I called you if you said you had five field trips because our parameters are two field trips. Um, really, it's a Title I program for uh, at-risk students or lowest performing students who uh, need to work on, right, their, their skills, their standards. Um, we usually say not not that field trip or can't just be doing whatever over here. Title I has some strict parameters um, and that we've conveyed over the years. So I just want to be really upfront that there are two different summer for sure. There's two different summer pots of money. One has three million for innovative ARP, maybe outdoor learning opportunities, things like that. Some of you have kind of camp like you've actually asked for camp like experience. And I've rejected that in the past with this uh, with Title I Summer. So maybe that's something. So it really is two different pots of funding. Think about what your needs are. If you want a Title I program again, great. I will not tell you not to apply. It's just a matter of what your needs are, what will best fit, and how to make sure you secure the funding for the programming that you want to run. So Title I Summer questions can come to me. They can come to your regional program manager, CCing me, because I run that grant for the most part with Jess's support. Um, but I just I just need to be clear that uh, there could be limitations to this funding and there always could be. And I also just wanna note um, Jackie Godbout, the old Title I staff, for those of you who have been here for a while, is actually running the ARP grant. So if you have questions about allowability or can this Title I program that I've typically run be funded through ARP right. where there's going to be more money, she will be able to answer those questions. I can put her, she has a main email, she's contracted, so I'll put her email in the chat like, that's for great. those of you who are putting some great questions about the ARP funding pool in the chat. That's great. I think, perfect. Yeah, Jess will connect, uh, give Jackie's email to those folks because the grant managers will be the the bearer of all sort of um, ability to really answer the thoroughness. And if you're like, this is the kind of program we want to run and they say, no, not, not us, then absolutely apply for our program and uh, within the parameters, we'll make it work. And I'll just, okay. I'll throw out there too, if you're in a situation, I think I mentioned this earlier, but you know, now is a good time to, you know, as you're thinking about summer and whatnot, to really look at what you have for carryover funding from prior fiscal years, um, whether it be Title I funds, Title V funds, Great Title IV funds. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if depending on the size and scope of your summer program, you may be able to supplement some of those costs with carryover funds that you may have available. That's a great point, Travis. And if they don't have a project that's a summer project that can be added as narrative and budgeted with funds that you might not be using. And you can, through your ESEA consolidated, be running summer programming. So that's another great example. Okay, I just wanted to make sure, I knew that there were tons of questions happening there, but I'm gonna stop sharing now and let folks um, come off mute or in the chat, feel free.